What is up, fence fam? Joe Everest, your fence expert. Today we have a, a unique story to share with you. We have talked about the importance of running a debt-free business, about whether you're leveraging yourself or not. Uh, we had a really good conversation about something that is going on on Facebook and the other social medias quite a lot, and that is, what do you charge for fence? And how that question can really get you sideways. And we wrapped it up with a really nice conversation about the importance of bringing equipment into your business. Without further ado, let's hear the fence story. Well guys, for the folks out at home that haven't met you guys, uh, would you mind introducing yourselves, who you are and your company and how long you've been building fence? I'm Debbie Roach. And I'm Don. How long have you guys been building fence? This is 42 years. 42 years. And the name of the company? D. Roach Fencing. D. Roach Fencing, very good. What kind of fencing do you guys love to build? If you could pick, a lot of us do a lot of different, but if you could pick one thing. We really like doing agricultural fence. Okay. Well guys, would you mind sharing with us your fence story? How did you guys originally get into fence? I, uh, I was working full time in a factory. Okay. And I, I didn't like working indoors. And I was working part time with my dad in the real estate and auctioneering business. Okay. And I wanted, the factory kind of took too much time. So I was kind of looking for something I could do because I, it wasn't enough to just quit my job and do the other full time. So I can do this and part time. Pretty soon I just loved it. I never did that auctioneering and real estate work anymore. And we've just been building fence. And we didn't know anything. Isn't it funny? That's kind of where everybody starts. And I, and I have that conversation with folks a lot where um, you know, because we'll see comments like in social media groups and all that. And I think some folks forget about everyone started somewhere. Yes. Everyone had day one. So what what kept you guys building fence? What kept you guys in the business? Mostly we, we just love doing it. We, we, we go out and build fence every day, the two of us together. Primarily agricultural? We, we do other stuff. We, okay. we do residential. Okay. We yeah. do uh, commercial, okay. industrial type work. But if you if you could choose one, it'd be it'd be farm. Oh yeah. yeah, you can't beat being out there in the middle of the country. Nobody's around you. You're just right. out there all by yourself. Yeah, the, you don't have a you don't have someone peeking over your shoulder, making sure you're doing it right. Maybe a few random pieces of livestock, but they don't carry the way anyway. A few cows once in a while. <laughs> so in the in the 40 years you guys have been building fence, what have you seen change? What have you seen change, whether it be in the industry or maybe and fin how it's built or what it's built with? What have you seen change? I'd say the biggest change has been in the equipment that okay. we have to use. Yeah. What have you guys seen stay the same? So has there been kind of a constant throughout the years? Well, that's kind of yes and no. I mean, okay. I suppose there's a little more high tensile now okay. than there was when we began, but there was high tensile then too. Sure. You know, the primary thing we do in our area is just 12 and a half gauge barbed wire. That's the main yeah. thing. Just yeah. Pretty common. Pretty common. That's super common. If you could give advice to somebody that was starting now, or maybe is thinking about starting, what advice would you guys give? First thing I'd tell anybody is to join the Fence Association. Yes. I'm glad you brought it up. So you guys are really active in the American Fence Association. Is that right? Mm-hmm. What is it about the association that draws you guys, that maybe that drew you to it and then kept you with it? The friendships we developed with the other fencers that we met. So they joined an association. I'm partial to the, I think we're all partial to American Fence Association just because we've been with it for a while, but they joined an association. What would be the next piece of advice? You have to be involved in the association. You can't just join and think it's going to help you. So that's a fair point because we see or I see in social media posts, folks talk about, well, I joined and whether it could be any of them, right? But I joined and I just, I really didn't get anything out of it. I didn't get, and then you ask like, well, what, how were you involved? What did you do? And like, well, I, you know, I, I joined the Facebook group and, and that was about it. I think that's part of the conversation we need to have is that you need to be involved, right? So we're actually having this conversation at the Shangri-La at the Midwest AFA's dinner meeting, and then we're going to have a golf tournament tomorrow. Um, but that's part of being involved, 
right, is coming to the meetings and just being around the other fence folks. Right, and it was about five and a half hour drive for us to come do this today. So, And obviously you believe it's worth it, investing that time and money and getting here and spending the weekend here, that sort of thing. What would you say the, the biggest thing that you get out of your involvement with the association would be? Well, I'm going to go back to the being involved, I think, a little more first. Yeah. It's not just that you go to the meetings. Go okay. get to the education stuff right. and get involved with it. Um, we've taught in the various AFA schools for the last, well, I don't know, 20, close to 25 years now. You, you just have to truly be involved to truly get the benefit out of it. I, I think I agree with you in that, yeah, the educational component is huge because I think right now, and, and I'm sure the question's been asked before, but it seems like the question that's being asked a lot right now is why? Why join any of the associations? Why, what, what does it bring to the contractor? And I think you hit the nail on the head when we talk about education. Because education is huge whether we're talking about the AFAs on the road training or the trainings during fence tech, that sort of thing. And I'm, and there's other trainings I'm sure too with the other associations, but education components are a big part of it as well. And I think it's also worth talking about that there's continuing education as well. There's ongoing education. And you can get education on the running, the management of the business, and you can get education on the building of the fence. Sure. So sure. through the associations, and we belong to a couple of them, you can get the, the information that you need to know without having to learn it all through your mistakes. I think that's a fair point in that really sometimes what you're learning is kind of where the potholes are in the road ahead of you. You know, you and I could sit down and you could tell me, hey, listen, you know, I've been, I've sat in your chair. I've been there before, and some things you're going to struggle with are X, Y, and Z. Now, I can't tell you how it would be best for you, but I can tell you how I handled it. I think that experience, that education, is probably worth more than whatever the annual fee might be if you avoid one of those potholes. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. What do you think maybe isn't being talked about in the fencing industry? Maybe. Well, let's talk about something I think people have been talking about too much. Okay. On especially on the internet nonsense here. Yeah. They all get to talking about how much does somebody charge? It doesn't make a lick of difference what somebody else charges. Absolutely agree. You have to know how fast you can do it, what your overhead is, you know, what it yeah. costs you to do it. Yeah. And then you have to decide how much profit you want to make on it. Sure. And you cannot get that off of what anybody else is charging. No, and that is that is an absolute great point. Because the, the example I give is your and my business could be exactly the same. The exact amount of employees, the exact same revenue, the exact same building, the exact same suppliers. And our, and our per foot or our per section, our pricing overall would likely be different. It'd be close, maybe, but it'd still be different because our goals are different. Well, not only that, but one person may be using their own money and the other person is leveraged. Yeah, yeah, and that so makes they've it, got a payment they need to make. It makes a big difference. Yeah. They're not factoring in, in the interest that keeps accruing on this note sort of thing. Well, and it's you and I could have different growth mindsets, too to where I might need to bring a little bit more in so I can squirrel it away for some future growth sort of thing. Or maybe I'm just wanting to go set the world on fire and get my name out there and raise some awareness, so maybe I charge a little less. Because the question that gets asked that we're talking about is, well, what do you guys charge for four-foot chain link, for six-foot privacy? It's like, how could you possibly answer that? But I think You can't. Absolutely not. And each job is different. Well, that's a fair point, too, even within the same business. I mean, it, we've gotten away from charging by the foot because a lot of times we'll end up getting bitten by that. Or, so we get bitten a few times. Well, then we start charging a little bit more so we don't get bitten. But then we find out we're overcharging the easy jobs. The easy digging, the one gate, square, there's not a pool in the way, there's no shed in the way or anything. 
those folks end up paying a little bit more than they probably should. So I think that's a fair point. I think people, new guys and gals especially, get caught up in the what do you charge because they don't know. They don't know what their overhead is. They don't know what their payroll would be, that sort of thing. But they don't know who's giving the answer either. If I asked you, hey, what do you charge for four-foot chain link? And you say, well, you know, I was told it's this. And then, but that person maybe told you a number that was based on somebody else's number. And by the time you work yourself down the line, you're already not making enough money. You're already underwater. Because maybe that answer was four years old, too. Especially in today's market where you just, you just can't base it off that number because you don't know. There's not enough information to answer that, you know, correctly. You know, you also have to know how busy you are. Yeah. If you're not busy enough, you probably need to be figuring out how you could charge a little less so you get more work. Yeah. If you're too busy, you probably need to be charging a little more so you get a little less work. I'm glad you brought that up. We all see these posts that say, I'm booked out to the end of the year. I'm booked out six months. I can't believe how good business is. I read a post like that and instantly I hear, I'm not charging nearly enough. In our business, and in, for my company, six weeks is kind of our sweet spot. I like to be about six weeks out. So if I look at our calendar and consistently, week on week, we're eight weeks out, I view that as an indication from the market that we're probably not charging enough. We're underpriced for the value we're bringing. Now, if I look at the schedule and we're three weeks out, well, we might be charging a bit too much for the value. Maybe we need to readjust the value proposition. But I think that's a good point is knowing how busy you are and knowing how busy you want to be and kind of pricing that into your price as well. And, and back on your point a minute ago about the size of your business, you yeah. have to figure that out. Yeah. How big do I want to be? That's fair. So Matt Warner talks about this a little bit in that when – so he's got a secret. So when he's planning on expanding or planning on adding new equipment, he'll add that into his budget before he actually does it. You know, if he's looking at leasing a truck, say, well, he'll figure out what's going to cost me $600 to lease this thing. I'm going to add that into my budget every month and just see if it works. See if I can make that monthly payment before I have to make it. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretend payment right now, but I'm putting money away for it so that then it, you know, in four to six months, I've got that money socked away. So I know it works and I've already got a down payment. But you're right in thinking about, do we want to grow? And if we do, well, that's going to cost some money. To your point, am I going to go leverage myself? Am I going to pull out a loan at whatever the current interest rate is, which we were spoiled for a while. The interest rates were low for a while, but that's not necessarily the case anymore. So I think that that also plays into the formula. On the interest rates, you know when we started. All you got to do is the math back. Sure, what did sure. the interest rates do then? <laughs> you guys have seen some high interest 18%. rates. They went from normal to 18%. Is that right? 18%. Let's talk about that for a minute because I think a lot of people are talking about maybe this is cyclical. Maybe we're seeing a cycle. What did... What did you guys see that do to maybe not just the fencing industry, but, but kind of the market in general when you guys saw interest rates go up to 18%? How did you see things react? At, at that time, we were doing almost nothing but ag. Okay. And the ag market got hammered. Really? So if you guys are building ag fence, maybe keep that in mind that, that we might be seeing the cycle come back around. So what aspect of fence building do we think changed us the most yeah. the dandy digger just bringing equipment into the business yeah what about the dandy digger changed your business or changed how you ran your business took the place of four people flat out yep. and you can dig a hole and it will be clean when you pull the auger out and what we were digging with before that it was a it was a bell tech a, yeah bell tech three point uh -huh. you, you dig your hole and then you're spending 10, 15 minutes, finish cleaning the yeah. dirt out. I, I am familiar. So we, we typically have someone that follows the bobcat around cleaning the holes out, yeah. Oh yeah, we don't do that anymore. We, we rarely, rarely have to clean a hole. Yeah, really? Occasionally we do, but it's rare. Okay. So when they came out to demo the unit to us, 
try to get us to buy one, he dug that hole and it was clean and I just said, we'll take it. <laughs> so now you know who was following. I was digging the holes and right, she was following, right, right. cleaning them out. She says, sold. Yep. I think I think the the replacement of labor also is an important point. It was especially, a big point, especially when we're seeing labor being harder to come by, quality labor being harder to come by. You kind of need something like that 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 doesn't call in, doesn't get sick, doesn't take personal days or have bad days or off days, or it shows up every day unless it needs maintenance, I guess. Well, any piece of equipment is going to break down. You're going to yeah. be working on it. Yeah, but equipment. It is vital. But but you would probably recommend, just in our conversation, you probably recommend saving up and purchasing it with money. I, I don't want to say with cash, but cash would be the term for having money in the bank to write a check for it or something like that, rather than take out debt for it. I would I would highly recommend that to anybody. Now, I'm not going to tell you that's what we did when we bought our first one. Right. No, but but let's, but this part of this conversation is bringing experience into the conversation. So if you had to do it again, would you have waited to do it without debt? I'm, I'm saying this as someone that has debt against my equipment. So I'm perfectly fine with that part of the conversation. Even today, if I didn't have the money, I'd borrow the money to do it again. It made that big of a difference. Made that big of a difference. Well, now I feel better about having a little bit of debt on our equipment. I feel a little bit better about that. So guys, uh, to wrap this up, I know you guys have probably learned truckloads and boatloads of tips and tricks when it comes to maybe running a business or or successfully you know getting through rough economies whatever it is if you could pick one or two things that you've learned that have been the most valuable maybe to your business what would you say those would be getting out of debt that's number one when we got to that point it was the best thing we ever did yeah. it changes absolutely everything when, when you don't have jobs. to meet a monthly mortgage or a monthly equipment payment or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just different. It makes all the difference. Yeah. I, I would imagine it probably took some stress off the shoulders. Is that right? A lot of stress goes away. You don't have to get that job because you have to make this payment. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Did it change how you ran your business? I mean, obviously, I guess in that example, it does, but, uh, or was it more business as usual? No, it, it changed how we ran the business a little because for a while, we didn't have the money to carry and not borrow the money. Yeah. So once you stop using your line of credit to pay your bills until a job comes in, that's difficult. So now sure. you've got to plan a little farther ahead. It became a little bit more complicated. It adds another layer of complexity to it then. Right. Well, guys, thank you. I, I know we've gone a little bit longer than what we talked about, but I appreciate you guys spending some time talking to me about about your fence story about living the fence life.